Okay, well, uh, shall we start with some prayer? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I, I pray for your blessing tonight. I pray that you would use my words to proclaim your truth. I pray that what I teach would be faithful to your word and that you would change the hearts of the people here if need be. You would give them something to encourage them, maybe something to challenge them. Lord, I pray that most of all that it is your word in your name. Amen. Well, thank you for having me. It's a pleasure to be able to preach. So tonight we'll be reading from the book of Judges. And the book of Judges is personally one of my favourite books in the Bible. Uh, it's an exciting book. It's full of action and war and destruction. Everything that a young guy seems to love. Uh, and it's a book that I've loved for a few years now. Uh, I went to an Easter camp in Waihola probably about four or five years ago. And there was a man there, Darren, who uh, was preaching from the book of Judges. And I fell in love with the stories that were found within it. And I absolutely love reading through this book. And it's a book that is full of heroes and heroines who, by the Spirit of God, are able to perform amazing acts to save Israel from a time of oppression. There are stories that you may know, such as Samson killing a thousand Philistines with the jawbone of a donkey. There's the story of Gideon leading an army of 300 to defeat a whole army of Midianites through confusion. There's the story of Deborah and Barak in which he doesn't even receive the glory for it because of his own doubts. But Judges is also a very shocking book. The things contained in this book are so shocking and sinful and stupid at times and wrong that they should shock you. Stories of murder and rape. There's a story of a man who makes a ridiculous vow to God which ends up with him having to sacrifice his own daughter because of how poorly worded it was. And by the time you reach the end of this book, you can clearly see that this was a terrible time in Israel's history. And yet, in this book of Judges, we can so clearly see God working for the benefit of his people. And it gives us, the church, wonderful instruction and encouragement in our faith. So, Judges chapter 3, verse 12 says, And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Now the reason it says again is because this is a pattern that the book of Judges follows. The pattern always begins and the Israelites repeatedly falling into the habit of doing what God hates. We see in chapter 3 ver and verse 7, it says, And the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. We just saw from verse 12. If we go a bit forward to 4 verse 1, it says, And the people of Israel again did what, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And this happens again and again and again. The Israelites repeatedly fall into the habit of idolatry and worshipping with the pagans. Now, we can see why they fall into this repeatedly if we look back in Judges chapter 2 for a bit of background. So, Judges 2, chapter 1, no, Judges chapter 2, verse 1, says, Now the angel of the Lord went up from Gilgal to Bochum, and he said, I brought you up from Egypt and brought you into the land that I swore to give your fathers. I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars, but you have not obeyed my voice. What is this you have done? So now I say, I will not drive them out before you, but they shall become thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to me. The first reason the Israelites repeatedly fall into this habit is because they disobeyed a command of God. The Israelites were commanded to drive out the Canaanites as they came into the promised land. This was the land God promised to his people. It was not for other pagan nations. Yet the Israelites allowed so many other Canaanites to stay. They created covenants with them. They brought some into slavery. They allowed their gods to remain. Meaning, because their gods were staying, 
they were going to be tempted. So God was punishing the Israelites for not obeying him and not driving out the Canaanites completely. And the second reason we see this repeated pattern is if we look a few verses later at verse 10 from in chapter 2, we see this. And it says, And all that generation also were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them who did not know the Lord or the work that he had done for Israel. Now Judges comes just after they've come into the promised land, just after the book of Joshua. So what most of us will know comes before, God has rescued them from Egypt, he's brought them into the wilderness, and now he's brought them into the promised land. And we know the amazing miracles God performed to bring them there. And yet we see here that the truth of God wasn't even displayed to the next generation in the land. The Israelites disobeyed and had troubles because they did not raise their children up in the Lord. The greatest saving event for God's people to date, God had done bringing them out of Egypt, and the next generation didn't even know about it because the people weren't bothered to teach them. So that leads us into the background of the story of Ehud and back into the story. So Ehud is the second judge in the book. He is the second cycle that begins with the Israelites being disobedient and doing what is evil against the Lord. And their punishment for this? Well, let's keep reading. And it says, continuing in verse 12, and the Lord strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they, because they had done what was evil in the sight of the Lord. The punishment, God raised up Eglon, a powerful Moabite king, who, as we continue reading, he gathered to himself the Ammonites and the Amalekites, along with two other Canaanite nations, ra rose up because of God, and they conquered the Israelites. So the Israelites were here in a fairly hopeless situation brought about by their own sinful ways as a nation. Not only had God allowed them to be conquered, he was the one who caused this happening to his own people. God was punishing the Israelites for their wrongdoings. As we find out earlier in the book, God uses the other nation, it tells us earlier in the book, in chapter 2, verse 20, I'll quickly read, 20. 20 onwards. So the anger of the Lord was kindled against Israel, and he said, Because this people have transgressed my covenant that I commanded the fathers and have not obeyed my voice, I will no longer drive out before them any of the nations that Joshua left when he died in order to test Israel by them. God was allowing the Canaanite, Canaanite nations to stay to test the Israelites' faithfulness to himself. And as we saw from verse 12, the Israelites failed. The Israelites' situation was so hopeless because of their own continual failure to obey God's good commands, and they instead worshipped with the pagans. And as we keep reading from verse 13, so they gathered the, themselves, the Ammonites and the Amalekites, and went and defeated Israel, and they took possession of the city of Palms, which we might know as Jericho. And the people of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, 18 years. But then, as we read from verse 15, Then the people of Israel cried out to the Lord, and the Lord raised up for them a deliverer, Ehud, the son of Gera, the Benjaminite, a left-handed man. So though the Lord had punished the Israelites, and they had gone 18 years having to serve a foreign king without any thought to God, as soon as they finally do cry out, God is still compassionate and he raises them up a deliverer in Ehud. So what do we learn about Ehud? Not much. We learn he's the deliverer. We learn who his father is, which he's pretty unimportant. We learn what tribe he belongs to and what handedness he is. Firstly, one of the main reasons I am personally fond of Ehud is the fact that he is a left-hander. I myself am left-handed, and being in that small group, I enjoy and take pride in left-handed success. For example, my favorite tennis player for the last decade or so has been a man by the name of Rafael Nadal. Never been much of a big on his game for any reason, 
is in other than the fact that he's a left-hander. So that's part of the reason why I fell in love with the story of Ehud. But Ehud being a left-handed will come um, very important later on. But also it seems slightly ironic that he's a left-hander because we see that he's from the Benjaminite tribe. Uh, Benjamin happens to mean son of the right hand. So Ehud is the left-hander from the right-hand tribe. Uh, at this point in time, also, the Benjaminites were the weakest tribe in Israel. They, they were not a very powerful tribe. They were very, very weak. And so it seems like a, a poor idea for God to choose a deliverer from this tribe. You'd think if you wanted to rescue your people from a pretty bad situation, you'd probably go to where the people are powerful, where... They might have the power to actually do something. But God uses a man from the weakest tribe in Israel to deliver his people in this story. Ehud is unique, but there is nothing about Ehud that makes him seem special. He's just a left-hander from a weak tribe. So how does God use him to deliver Israel? So let's continue reading. We're up to verse 16 now. And that says, And Ehud made for himself a sword with two edges, a cubit in length. So that's about a foot and a half. And he bound it on his right thigh under his clothes. And he presented the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man. Now this is where Ehud's left-handedness comes very important. When coming to the king's palace, he's part of a group of Israelites who are coming to pay tribute to the king. They're giving him resources and money so that he will rule them kindly. Now the security in the palace would have checked every single person's left thigh for a weapon because right-handedness was the norm of the day and a right-handed soldier would put their sword on their left-handed thigh. But because Ehud was a left-handed warrior, his sword he placed on his right-handed thigh and it went unnoticed going into the palace. They did not check his right thigh because no one would put their sword there. And so he was able to bring the sword in. And then Ehud and those with him, they left. But after a little way, Ehud returned to the king. And he said to him in verse 20, oh, not 20, 8, 19, he says, he himself turned back at the idols near Gilgal and said, I have a secret message for you, O king. And he commanded silence so that means that and all his attendants went out from his presence so Ehud came back to see the king and he probably preyed on the king's pride a little bit the king was probably quite felt himself very important and I mean why shouldn't he he's the king and Ehud used that against him he came and said he had a secret message, the sort of thing that his attendants wouldn't be able to listen to. They're unimportant. And so the king made everybody leave. And Ehud said, I have a message from God for you. And here in verse 20, and he arose from his seat. And then verse 21, and Ehud reached with his left hand, took the sword from his right thigh and thrust it into his belly. Ehud used the king's pride to bring him alone in his room and then he murdered him. <laughs> the story goes into quite a bit of detail about how it happens. In verse 22 it says, And the hilt also went in after the blade, and the fat closed after the over the blade, for he did not pull the sword out of his belly, and the dung came out. Now I preached about this in Gore a couple of months ago and one of the feedback I got for when I was pre planning to preach it here tonight was to talk less about the bodily fluids. So I will spare you, I will spare you the detail a bit more. Some of the people in Gore enjoyed it. <laughs> so Ehud's sword, which we, we saw earlier, was about 45 centimetres long and was completely covered in the through the king's fat in the body. That's how big the man was. That when it went in, it became completely encased in his fat. It's just a very gruesome and horrific 
detail that it goes into with this. And then Ehud seeked his escape, which says, from verse 24 through to 27 says, When he had gone, the servants came, and when they saw that the doors of the roof chamber were locked, they thought, surely he is relieving himself in the closet of the cool chamber. And they waited till they were embarrassed, but when he still did not open the doors of the roof chamber, they took their key and opened them, and there lay their Lord dead on the floor. Ehud escaped while they delayed, and he passed beyond the idols and escaped to Sarah. When he arrived, he sounded the trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. Then the people of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he was their leader. Ehud used what he knew. He knew that the servants would be a bit nervous to go in straight away. It probably smelt pretty horrific in there. They probably thought he was doing other stuff. So he used that to his advantage to be able to escape. And when he escaped, he sounded the trumpet and pulled the people of Israel together. And he said, Ehud sounded the trumpet, gathered the Israelite army and said, Follow after me, for the Lord has given your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. And they went and seized the fords of the Jordan, the area that joined Israel and the Moabites' home country, and they trapped the panicking Moabites killing over 10,000 and not letting a single man free, which was what they were meant to have done at the beginning of the book, not allowing any of the other nations to stay in the country. They removed them all, taking the promised lands completely. And verse 30, So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. So what can we take away from this for ourselves? The story of a man killing a king to save his people. What does that mean for us? The first point I have is about obedience to the Lord. So the first thing we can take away from this is when we look at the Israelites, and that is a picture of disobedience or obedience and trust towards God. So don't make God as a last resort as the Israelites did. It took them 18 years of serving under a foreign king for them to finally cry out to God. Let God be the first and primary receiver of your worship and obedience. How short would this story be if the Israelites were faithful to God? Judges 3 would read, And the Israelites had peace in the land for hundreds of years. But because of their unfaithfulness, they had to go through so much. Now, I'm not saying that if each of us have a little bit more faith, everything's going to be amazing. But what I am saying, however, is when we are continually unfaithful like the Israelites, when we do choose the idols of our life, as the Israelites chose the idols of the pagans, we shouldn't be surprised if what we do come up in life, face in life, is suddenly that much harder and weighs down on us that much more. God's Word says in Proverbs chapter 3, verse 5 and 6, Trust in the Lord with all your heart and lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him and he will make straight your path. The command there is to trust in the Lord with all we have. And the promise is him making straight your path. When we are faithful, God does reward us by working in our lives for our good benefit. Not to necessarily make everything that is hard go away, but I assure you, if you are faithful and you can really feel the God of the universe on your side, that hardship will not mean so much to you. My second point is that God is always at work. And this is in continuation with the first. And that is God is still working for the good of his people, even when all seems hopeless. The Israelites were in subjection for 18 years. And there was nothing to suggest that would change. And then when God finally does send a deliverer, he sends an unremarkable man whose claim to fame is being left-handed. Someone who was going to sneak a sword into the king's palace, stab him, have time enough to go back to his own people, rally the troops, and then block off the Moabites' exit. It seems a bit far-fetched, the plan, and yet it worked so perfectly why? Because God made it so. 
Now, my encouragement there is not to be like Ehud and go around stabbing monarchs no matter how bad they are. But what I do encourage you to remember is that whatever seems hopeless is not an indication of an absence of God. Today we live in what seems to be a post-Christian world. Everybody seems to have their own idea of morality. And the idea of today is the same as it was in the time of Judges. As we read that thing, as it says, and the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. Well, that's what people do today. And it's because they do what everybody thinks is right. They do what they Later on, we see in the book of Judges, it changes it slightly. It says, in those days, there was no king and everybody did what was right in their own eyes. Well, that's the way the world is today. And that's the way it's been for a long time. Everybody does what is right in their own eyes. Christian morality no longer holds power in our secular world so much. We saw just this week the final part of the Israel Falau saga. He's now lost his rugby contract simply for quoting God's word. The world hates God. The world seeks to get rid of the idea of God. It seeks to get rid of the morals that we live by because God teaches us so. And yet we can clearly see that God is at work because today you sit, you are one day closer to eternal glory than you were yesterday. Even if everything in this life seems corrupt, God is working for your good purpose, which ultimately ends in the glorification of yourself, being with him. Now, my final point, and by far the most important one, is that Ehud shows us the need for a greater deliverer. Judges 3 verse 30, follow along with me. It says, So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel, and the land had rest for 80 years. And then let's go two verses later. And the people of Israel again did what was evil in the sight of the Lord after Ehud died. And the Lord sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor. Ehud gave God's people peace for 80 years. And yet, when we have an eternal life ahead of us, 80 years seems pretty small when you consider that eternity that is either spent in heaven or in hell. And yet, on our own, none of us deserve heaven. We are all like the Israelites there. We all do what is evil in the sight of the Lord. And because of that, God would be completely just to send each and every one of us in this room to an eternity of pain and torment. Romans 6.23 tells us the wages of sin is death, and we are all sinners. But that's not God's way. He sent his one and only Son, who is perfect in nature, to pain and torment upon the cross. And in him doing so, we have been given the offer of life everlasting, a life without pain, life without misery, a life without mourning, life with Jesus and God. And as the rest of Romans 6, 23 finishes, it says, But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. What we need is that greater deliverer that is Jesus. And so my challenge to you all tonight is to check your own hearts. Are you right with God? Because if you're living a life that is evil to the, to the Lord, like the Israelites were, without repentance, the Lord will not hesitate when you die to send you to a life of suffering but if you are following the Lord in faith and in repentance then that punishment has already been given to his son and we don't have to bear it anymore so those are the three things to take away we're called from the story to trust in the Lord no matter what because God is working for good even when we don't see it and most importantly Christ is that greater deliverer who offers life and who we all need to have, to bow down in faith and repent of our sins before. Okay, shall we pray? Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the story of Ehud that you allowed to be recorded for our benefit. 
Lord, I pray that we would not be like the Israelites and just desire to do what we want, to do what we see as fit and good. But Lord, we would desire to do what you think is good. We pray that we would always look to Christ as a great deliverer. Lord, Ehud was not great enough for us. Christ is a deliverer that can deliver for eternity. And we give great thanks that you sent him to take the punishment that we deserve. Lord, we pray as for the week ahead. We pray that we would be encouraged in your truth strengthened in our faith and desire to follow you each and every day. Pray this in your name. Amen. Okay, and we'll sing our final hymn, which is Turn Your Eyes Upon Jesus.